This is the Chase Sapphire Reserve, and it used to be a perennial contender for best travel card of the year. Every single year it was in the running. But over time, and really since 2019, the card has kind of been on the downhill slide, with a lot of features and benefits just getting stale. At the same time, there have been some very exciting competitors coming onto the stage. And so now the question is, could this latest devaluation from Chase finally be the last nail in the coffin for the Chase Sapphire Reserve? And is it now time to cancel this card? Well, that's what we're gonna try to find out in today's video. Hi, I'm John of John's Finance Tips. And this is a channel we dedicate to talking all things money. Today's money topic is going to be the Chase Sapphire Reserve and whether or not the latest devaluation and loss of benefit would warrant possibly cutting the card. And to get there, I wanna set the stage for you and provide some context by first talking about a brief history of the card, as well as a high level overview of the credit card and its features and benefits. And finally, this latest evaluation in my final verdict and recommendations. Part one, a quick history of the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And the reason we wanna talk about the history of the card is because when it launched in 2016, nothing like it had ever actually been on the marketplace. And what I mean is this was the very first viral credit card. It was the first credit card that pulled non-credit card enthusiasts into the credit card market because the value it presented was just such a no-brainer. It had a massive sign-up bonus. It had very good earnings and it had benefits that just made it such a great return on investment when you think about the annual fee. And I still remember when the card was launched because I just started getting into some of the more premium credit cards. I was interested in the Sapphire Preferred. However, when the Sapphire Reserve launched, it was just such a no-brainer for me to jump on that offer. And that really kicked off a lot of it for me when I think about all the points and miles and redemptions that I've been doing over the years. And the Sapphire Reserve was so successful that it even caught Chase by surprise. Yes, JP Morgan Chase, the people who launched the credit card, didn't expect it to be received the way it was received. And in saying that, there was actually a material net negative impact because of the number of points that they had to pay out to people because so many people were demanding the card. In fact, I think Chase was actually losing money on the Sapphire Reserve, but they were okay with it because they wanted to get customers into the Chase ecosystem and hopefully convert them into deposit customers or mortgage customers, basically places where they can make more money off of you. And I'm not sure how exactly that played out because I think people who ended up getting the Sapphire Reserve kind of understood the value and understood the gamification, if you will, of it. And so they might've not converted to the way that Chase wanted to. Now, that leads to a later issue we'll talk about when it comes to sign up bonus. But the takeaway is the fact that this card caught everyone by surprise when it launched in 2016. It pretty much went viral and it put Chase on the map as an issuer of one of the best premium travel cards. And I would say from 2016 to 2019, it deserved that title. It very much was still offering tremendous value for what you had to pay for it. But really since then, it hasn't differentiated much. And we've seen new and exciting offers and competitors come onto the marketplace. And I really don't think Chase has responded as effectively to them. But before getting to this latest evaluation, let's talk about the high level overview of what this card actually offers today. Part two, overview of the card. We'll talk about sign-up bonus, earnings, benefits, annual fee. Sign-up bonus. Right now, this card will earn you 60,000 Chase Ultimate Reward Points after you spend $4,000 within the first three months. Earnings. This card will earn 10 points per dollar spent if you book your hotel or car rental through the Chase Travel Portal, 10 points while spent if you book any dining through Chase Dining, five points while spent if you book your airfare through the Chase Travel Portal, three points while spent if you book any dining, three points while spent on all travel, and one point while spent everywhere else. Now into the benefits, where a card like this should really start to shine. So this card has a $300 annual travel credit. Super simple to use, as long as you swipe your card and it codes as travel, you're gonna get a credit for it. The card also has a $100 credit to global entry every single year. Remains to be seen whether it'll be elevated because global entry prices have just gone up, but regardless, if you were to get it now and you swipe for global entry, you should be good. Next, this card offers transfer partners. So in this whole travel hacking points and miles game, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck when you take points from a program like Chase or an American Express or Capital One and you move it or transfer it to an airline or hotel partner because there you can find some sweet spots to get more value from your points. And Chase has a number of transfer partners. One of the ones I think is most valuable for the most amount of people is going to be Hyatt. Hyatt is probably the last standing hotel program that actually has an award chart and that you can actually get good value from your points. Unlike our friends over at Marriott where you absolutely get almost no value from your points whatsoever. There's a bunch of different examples for Hyatt that we can run through. One of them would be potentially staying in New York City. 
You could spend 40,000 Hyatt points or you could spend over $1,000 at the park Hyatt. But Chase isn't just limited to having Hyatt as a transfer partner, you can also transfer your points to Air France. With Air France, with 50,000 points, you could fly one way from North America over to Paris instead of spending four or five thousand dollars out of pocket it would be that fifty thousand points and about maybe three to four hundred dollars in taxes and fees however if getting out to europe isn't quite your cup of tea you can take your points from chase you can transfer them to air canada's aeroplan and you could book for a flight from north america all the way over to asia maybe flying on singapore airlines for eighty seven thousand five hundred points and about a hundred dollars or so in canadian dollars in taxes and fees that otherwise would have cost you four to five thousand dollars cash again there are a billion different ways that you can mix and match and transfer and optimize but really just want to show you at a high level how i would do it and if you want a way to find award seats what i actually use is a program called seats.arrow it's 100 free to use if you're searching from now until maybe two to three months out if you want to look for something nine or 12 months out you will have to get the premium version i subscribe to it i think it's totally worth it but again you don't have to feel free to check out the free version to see what award seats are available to you. The Sapphire Reserve also offers you a 50% bonus if you redeem your points through the Chase Ultimate Reward Travel Portal. So for me, I've got about 2.4 million Chase Ultimate Reward points. If I just use that and redeemed it through the Chase Ultimate Reward Travel Portal, that would be worth a little over $36,000 in travel. Now, you could also make an argument though that 2.4 million could be worth significantly more if they transfer them around, but this is a good way, especially I think domestic economy, even sometimes long haul economy, where it might make sense to get the 50% bonus by using your points versus the transfer partner option. This card also gives you benefits to access lounges. Specifically, you get a complimentary priority pass membership. And so with priority pass, at airport lounges, instead of having to go to the airport, right, get that really crappy cold cut sandwich, fighting for a seat at the gate, trying to connect to the crappy Wi-Fi. You go to an airport lounge, there's free food, usually free booze, there's gonna be Wi-Fi, there's gonna be seating. And if you're out in some place like Europe or especially in Asia, things like day beds, shower cabanas, like all that is available to you, free and complimentary by having Priority Pass and you get Priority Pass complimentary of having a Chase Sapphire Reserve. In addition, Chase has recently launched their own network of lounges. So in my home airport of Boston, we have one in between Terminal B and C, the Chase Sapphire Lounge. I would say it's probably one of the best lounges in that airport. Short of actually flying in a first class or business class configuration where you get access to even better lounges, the Chase Sapphire Lounge in Boston, I would say is definitely top tier. You've got a phenomenal bar. You have basically made to order food. In addition, there's like a zero gravity massage chair and you can do a red light mask. I mean, it's completely over the top and I absolutely love it. They also have two that are open down in New York, one in LaGuardia and one in JFK as well. I've only been to the one in JFK and it's kind of a small one, but the one in LaGuardia I've heard is massive with like a staircase and everything. Again, this is complimentary by having a Chase Sapphire Reserve card and you can go as many times as you want. The Sapphire Reserve also provides some trip insurance. So one of them is called trip delay coverage, where if your flight is delayed six or more hours, you can claim for a max benefit of $500 per ticket. And if you do decide to book your car rental with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, you're gonna be able to just waive the insurance they try to sell you because it comes with the Chase Sapphire Reserve annual fee. This card comes in at $550 a year. Remember, you do have a $300 travel credit, and so effectively, you're paying $250 a year for this card. Now the tomatoes and potatoes, the part three. What exactly is its devaluation and update that could potentially have some people thinking they should ax the card? Well, that has to do with the Priority Pass benefit. So when the Chase Sapphire first launched, it had some amazing benefits. One of them was Priority Pass. And what was unique about the Priority Pass from the Chase Sapphire Reserve was that not only could you go to lounges, you can also go to certain restaurants that you would get a credit anywhere from $28 to $30, as well as for your guests to be able to dine. And to me, I actually thought this was a phenomenal benefit because if you know anything about lounges in the US, a lot of them are pretty meh. Some of them just outright suck. However, when you're able to use a credit at a restaurant, you're gonna get better quality food. In addition to, if you're just running to and from a flight, you get the food, you're on the flight, you're good to go. I actually was able to use this benefit a lot when I was departing from Sydney because in Sydney, there were actually some Priority Pass restaurants that were pre-security. And so if you were just going there to drop someone off, you could actually use your Priority Pass, get food for free, and then get on with your day. However, effective July 1 of 2024, the Priority Pass benefit from the Chase Sapphire Reserve is no longer going to be able to get any restaurant benefit. And so now it's just like most other Priority Passes. And it's not just the Sapphire Reserve that's gonna lose this benefit, it's also gonna be the Chase Ritz-Carlton card as well as the JP Morgan Reserve card. 
Yes, the JP Morgan Reserve card, so where someone needs to have a $10 million net worth is also going to lose this benefit. So then what exactly is my verdict and recommendation? Honestly, I know some of you sitting out there might be thinking, what's the big deal? We went through all the benefits and all the earnings and this card seems great. And in a vacuum, sure, but you have to understand context. And the context is this card used to provide so much value, so many benefits that it was clear in a way the number one travel card in the entire marketplace. But over time, it hasn't really kept up. For example, having transfer partners and having elevated earnings is not novel at all. And specifically, let's talk about the earning three points per hour spent on dining. You could get a card that's gonna earn you four points per hour spent on dining, effectively pay only $10, and you still get the transfer partners, AKA the American Express Gold. You could get a card that you have to pay no annual fee from, and you still get transfer partners, and you still get the 3X on dining, AKA the no annual fee built MasterCard. Then what about the sign-up bonus? The sign -up bonus 60,000 points for 4k spend. That's solid. Sure, but you could also get the Venture X, which is going to earn you 75,000 points after spending $4,000. And again, it competes in the exact same category as a Sapphire Reserve as a premium travel card. Not to mention the Venture X is actually putting five bucks back into your pocket instead of you having to pay 250 effectively. So hopefully this is painting the picture that the card is great, but then what used to make it special? Well, what used to make it special was the fact that the Chase Sapphire Reserve was one of the last holdouts in the premium card category that had a priority pass membership that gave you restaurant benefits. American Express Platinum used to have it. I think they lost it in 2019. And the Capital One Venture X, I believe lost it in 2022. And so the Sapphire Reserve was the last holdout. And with the loss of it, it's just not that much meat on the bones for the everyday person, in my opinion. To get the restaurant benefit now, you have to get to City Prestige, which you can't apply for. The other card is gonna be the Venture X Business Flavor, not the personal. You can also get it from the Bank of America Premium Rewards Elite card. And the only reason no one's really jumping at these cards is, well, the Bank of America one is just not in a large ecosystem. You don't have transfer partners. The Venture X, it is a solid card in my opinion, but you have to be comfortable getting a business card. In the City Prestige, you just can't apply for. <laughs> so then allow me to make an argument of why someone would keep it because I clearly still have my Sapphire Reserve. The reason you might want to keep it is that the fact that you get a 50% bonus if you redeem your Chase Ultimate Reward Points through their travel portal. Having 2.4 million points, that's equivalent to $36,000 of travel. That very much is an enticing offer for me. The second point you want, might want to make is that the Sapphire Lounges are really, really nice. Someone flying out of Boston, aka me, I like the Sapphire Lounge a lot. If I'm flying either C or B terminal, basically if I'm flying American, United, or JetBlue, I'm gonna try to make my way to the Sapphire Lounge versus just any old Priority Pass lounge. In addition, some people might actually even make the argument that because Chase is now investing in their own lounge infrastructure, that's probably why they're okay to pare back some of the benefits on their Priority Pass membership. Now let's talk about why someone would cancel it. Well, the very apparent reason for me is the fact that it's just not that special in the top tier category. Let's say you're not a power user. Let's say you're just considering getting a premium travel card. Well, if you got the Capital One Venture X, you get a better sign-up bonus. The earnings are okay, but then you end up being paid net positive $5 to get kind of similar bells and whistles as a Sapphire Reserve. So then why would you get a Sapphire Reserve if you can get paid five bucks for a premium travel card? Again, back to the earning dining. You can get four X earnings on dinings for a car that you effectively pay $10 a year for in the name of the American Express Gold. You still have the transfer partners, so why get the Sapphire Reserve to pay a higher annual fee to get those transfer partners? And if you don't wanna pay an annual fee, the no annual fee built MasterCard comes in with the three excellent dining earning, and you have the transfer partners still. And so in my opinion, I think there's just better options out there other than the Sapphire Reserve if you're not gonna take advantage of the 50% bonus and if you're not gonna take advantage of the Sapphire lounges. Though, as always folks, this has been a great video. I would like to hear from you all. If you currently hold a Sapphire Reserve, are you planning to keep it? And if you don't have a Sapphire Reserve, does this deter you from potentially applying for it? And if you'd like to support my channel in any way, all of my top card offers are gonna be linked down below. Feel free to check them out and I'll catch you on the next video. Peace.